Are you glad to be saved? Amen. If you're not glad, then you're probably not saved. <laughs> Page 450 in the Great Hymns of the Faith. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? <clears throat> there will never be a sweeter story, story of the Savior's love divine, love that brought him from the realms of glory, just to save a sinful soul like mine. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful, wonderful. Isn't the love of Jesus something? Amen. Wonderful it is to me. Boundless as a universe around me. Reaching to the farthest soul away. Saving, keeping love it was that found me. That is why my heart can truly say, Yes, it is. Wonderful, wonderful. Is it the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to be. Even when you got a flat tire? Love beyond our human comprehending. Love of God in Christ, how can it be? This will be my theme and never ending. Great redeeming love of Calvary. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me. Amen. Page 475. Redeemed. You're redeemed if you're saved. Amen. Amen. You've been bought with a price. <clears throat> redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. child and forever I am redeemed and so happy in Jesus no language by rapture can tell I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell redeemed 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 by the blood of the lamb redeemed His child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. His child and forever I am. Some of these are hard for me to sing because it says, I think of him all the day long. Do you? I mean, come on, do you really? Because there's got to be sometimes when you don't. It's like when you drop something on you. <laughs> all right. Well, does that hit home, does it? Yeah, amen. Oh, amen. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed 
by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem, redeem his child and forever I am. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, I was thinking of him. When they pulled out in front of me, I was thinking, boy, you know, you'd be lucky God don't strike you with lightning. So I was thinking about him, <laughs> but I'm glad you're out on this beautiful Sunday. Amen. Amen. Brother Long, at least was there. Amen. All right, you may be seated. All right, just uh, one quick prayer request here. Uh, Brother and Sister Sortor just kind of need your prayer right now. And that's, uh, we'll just leave it at that, all right? Just remember to pray for the Sortors right now, just their family. All right. Um, <clears throat> camp meeting next Sunday starts. Next Sunday morning, Brother Calvin will be here. He's worth coming. His wife's not going to be able to come because during all this stuff, of course, last week, I think he told me it was the first meeting he's preached since March. And so his wife had to go to work for a couple of, you know, loss of uh, income. So be praying for him. I'm looking forward to him being here. If you were here last year, you know he'll bless your heart when he preaches. And ladies, uh, tomorrow night, here at the church, uh, ladies' meeting, uh, they're going to be making mass. Uh, it got silent for a moment there. We, yeah. All right, and you have a project new and coming up in uh, this week. I guess they'll decide tomorrow night. I just gave Stephanie some. Where did she went? She went. Oh, okay. Uh, she's a nurse, but I just gave her some new addresses and stuff for much more bold, so we want to check with Stephanie. And she also has some sheets, maybe you've forgotten. Uh, they're just blank. They've got name, address, so forth. And you can take that if you somebody that you would like to visit and call that a visit and write it down and give it back to us so we can kind of, you know, see what's going on. If you'll do that, please. Uh, you don't have to make them a member of the church or you don't have to drag them here, but you made the visit, gave them the word, gave them a track, whatever you did. And it kind of helps us keep track of what's going on. And our community needs the Lord more than probably it realizes. And I think we're going to need the Lord more than we realize here right shortly. So street preaching, as long as we can. Uh, the corner of uh, Houghton and 3rd. Yeah, there we go. All right. Um, Buckeye Baptist Church. In Buckeye, Arizona, Pastor James Roy is our pastor in church to pray for this coming week. I don't think there's anything else I'm aware of. All right. Gentlemen.
All right, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of, uh, yes, right there, Mark chapter 4. We'll turn to Mark chapter 4. We're going to read 1 through 21. Would you stand, please? Mark chapter 4, 1 through 21. I'll read, you read, and we'll read together. Amen. And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it grew no And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable, and how then will ye know all parables? And these are they, and these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake immediately they are offended and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? All right. Let's turn in your songbooks to page uh, 357. Son. 
Sun, moon, and stars forget, upward I fly, still all my song shall be nearer, my God, to thee, nearer, my God, to thee, Please be seated. I'd like to have the choir come on up.
times when my faith would falter and no sunlight I can see. I just lift my eyes to Jesus and I whisper, pilot me. soul is weary and the day seem oh so long I just look up to my pilot and I hear this blessed song fear thou not for I'll be with thee I will still thy pilot be Billows. Take my hand and trust in me. When temptations round me gather and I almost lose my way, somehow in the raging tempest, I can hear. Savior say, Amen. Fear thou not, for I'll be with thee. I will still thy pilot be. Never mind the tossing billows. Take my hand and trust in me. Jordan's river and its troubled waters see. On the brink I'll see my Savior and I know he'll pilot me. Fear thou not for I'll be with thee. I will still thy pilot be. Tossing billows, take my hand and trust in me. Well, the reason why some people don't go very good because they've got God as their co-pilot. I've seen that little sticker, and when it's God's my co-pilot, I'm going to say, there's where you're going wrong. Because the co-pilot seems to know more than the pilot. Genesis chapter 6 in my devotions this week. The Lord showed me something. And I have to admit, uh, it takes a while for him to find something I don't know. Something like about 35 millionths of a second. But uh, not anything we don't know, I don't think. It's just something maybe we don't spend time uh, thinking about. But let's uh, begin verse 1. Then we're also going to be in the book of Hebrews and Second Peter, so... Uh, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. So, Sister Carol, there's your first math class in the Bible right there. They're doing multiple. And they never do algebra after this. I just want you to know that. So. Um, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all that which they chose. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, 
I deal with that in my book on angels, so if you're interested in that. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, and the, his days shall be 120 years. And the Lord just about cut that in half when he finally got done with it. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same began, became mighty men and were of old renown, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And there's a strange one. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. At the same time he repented, at the same time he was grieved. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me, I have made them. That's twice he said it. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll look at verse 7. That's in the New Testament. I said that for myself. Verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. And Second Peter 2, I'll read a couple verses here, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, being in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, whatever it is that you have for this message, whatever it is you wish to show us, please make yourself clear and known to us. won't be any second guessing. We won't have to say maybe so, think so, hope so. We'll know so. Lord, if there should be one person here today without Jesus Christ our Savior, might this be the last day that'll happen. Maybe they'll get saved today, Lord. And, uh, Lord, for any Christian, any saint of God who's just teetering on the edge right now, doesn't know what to do, would you please strengthen them and bless them and give them something that will help them, I pray. This preacher is unworthy to be here. You know that. And I pray that you would, besides that fact, that you'll go ahead with your word and do what you need to do. And I'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Noah is known, of course, for building the ark that saved a selective number of animals and eight people. He's also known for planting a vineyard and enjoying the fruit thereof until he got drunk. Solomon said it well in Ecclesiastes 7.20, There is not a just man upon the earth that doth good and sinneth not. He didn't say there was not a just man on the earth. He just said there wasn't one that didn't sin. I want you to consider some things about this man that are perhaps sometimes overlooked. As with Enoch, Noah also walked with God. According to Genesis 6, 9, and as with Job, Job 1, he was a perfect man. And Joseph, the husband of Mary, was called a just man, and so was Noah. So understand that uh, whatever's thought of Moses... Or I'm sorry, whatever thought of Noah, he was a man equal to many other men. And we'll show you some other things as we go through this message. But I want you to understand, Noah is a different character. Uh, even more remarkable is the fact that even Lot, in 2 Peter 2.7, is called a just man. You say, preacher, I just don't understand that. Okay, I'm going to help you understand it right now, okay? 
I can't help you with it at this moment, but in about three hours, <laughs> in a little while, we'll be done here. You go home, go to your bathroom if that's where it's at, look in the mirror, and all of a sudden, you'll realize, hey, I'm no better off than Lot. You just think you are. Don't you think it's unique that in the very beginning of time there is a man in society that's a preacher? See, people want worship leaders. And they seek after teachers, according to Paul. But God gave the world a preacher. Noah was a preacher. He was a preacher of righteousness. He wasn't a worship leader. He was a preacher. He was certainly a pre picture of one who preached in season <laughs> and out of season. And that was, of course, what Paul advised Timothy to do. Why did Noah find grace in the eyes of the Lord? Let me say this of it. It didn't say God showed Moses grace. It didn't say Moses, or Moses, I'm sorry, Noah. It didn't say Noah got saved by grace. It said God saw. What does it say? You don't remember, do you? Turn back to Genesis. Let's go there. I want you to see it. See, we're sometimes in trying to make it fit your theology, it doesn't work. So it says right here, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What was it about Noah that when God looked down there, he saw something different? Is this working? All right. He saw something different. What was it about Noah in that day and all the other people? And if you go back through the previous part of the chapter, uh, there you see who begot who and who died and all that, and you get down to Methuselah and Lamech and all those people. There was a lot of people, Enoch, Walked with God and was not, for the Lord took him. A few hundred years before Noah showed up, but nonetheless, I'm just saying, there's always been somebody in every generation that the Lord took note of. And the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then when I read that, I got to thinking, okay, so what was it that the Lord saw in Noah that he found grace and that he said, here's what I want you to do. What was it about Noah that, that God was so interested in he could find one man that would carry out what he wanted done? Think about that a minute. You remember over there in Ezekiel, it says, looking for a man to stand in the gap? But the Bible said this, he found none. Well, I'll show you something else out of Ezekiel in a minute. But I want you to understand something. There's something different about Noah. What was it? What was it that God saw in Noah and said, that's the guy I'm, I'm going to do it? What was it that he saw in a shepherd boy sitting in the middle of the hill and said, I'm going to make him my king? And he's not going to be just a king for now, but he's going to be the king that's going to sit on the throne of my kingdom. What was it about a young girl who was walking across the ground in, the, uh, in that area of the country and God reached out and said, that's the woman I'm going to have to bring my son into the world. What is it? There's something about why God picks certain people to do some things. There are people who say, well, I can't do anything. Well, I'm going to show you something else about that. In 2 Peter chapter 2, we see there in verse 5 that Peter uh, refers to uh, Noah as a preacher of what? All right, so first of all, let me say this of Noah. He believed in righteousness. We look back at those days as it was in the days of Noah and it was in the days of Lot, and we don't see anything written in those passages right there that sounds very righteous. But again, let's don't just look back in those old dark days and say, boy, there's things never been like that. Well, I don't know. Uh, why don't you look around your country and see? But there was a man. He believed in righteousness. Let me give you a definition. It's a long one, but let me give it to you. Purity of heart, rectitude of life, conformity of heart and life to the divine law. Righteousness, as used in the scripture and theology in which it is chiefly used, it is nearly equivalent to holiness. 
comprehending holy principles, affection of the heart, conformity of life to divine law. It includes all we call justice, honesty, virtue, holy affection. In short, it's true religion. If you want to say, I'm just giving you what Mr. Webster said. Say, what are you saying? This man was a preacher and he had all of those qualities? Somehow or another, we don't stop to think, what does it take to be the man God uses? Well, first of all, I think you better understand righteousness is going to be a part of it. Do you want to know why sometimes uh, these preachers can get such big crowds somewhere? They're letting everything about life, which you need to adjust to, go by the wayside and say, it's not important. God loves you just like you are. And that's found in... Now, nobody in this room is going to be holy and just and all those kind of things before you get saved. But when you get saved, there should be a change in your life. You know, an interesting phrase found in Hebrews 11, verse 7 says that he became an heir of righteousness. And I looked at that thing and said, an heir of righteousness. How could, you, how could you be an heir of righteousness? I mean, when I think of a person's an heir, I think of somebody, uh, there's a money or a home or something involved, and they're, gonna, they're an heir, and they're going to get that. And then I looked back, and I saw about Abel and his righteousness. And I realized that that line of righteousness started with a man, maybe Enoch, I don't know, and worked his way from Abel to Enoch. To, and that he became, listen to me, he became an heir of honesty, justice, virtue, holy affections. You say, well, I don't see it, preacher. I mean, I don't see what you're trying to say. Well, let me ask you a question. Down your family line, what are your children and your grandchildren going to be picking up? Maybe what's wrong with the country, while well, we want to blame the kids running around with BLM and all that kind of stuff, why we want to blame them, who is it that should have taught them different? Say, well, the kids, they don't come back to church. When they get 18, they leave and they don't come back. I wonder why. Come on, folks, it don't just happen. It didn't just happen. There's a reason. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Because he was a man of righteousness. He was a preacher of righteousness, holiness, sanctification. All the things that we learn in the New Testament are supposed to happen to a Christian when they get saved. You know, sometimes maybe we do these men a disjustice. Saying, well, they were in the Old Testament, so that's different. <laughs> I don't know. If they had to live by the law and they lived and they became a righteous man, I'd say that's pretty good. Didn't Paul say that he was blameless in the face of the law? People say, well, it's not possible. You're not working at it. Abel. Noah is carrying on what Abel started. <laughs> I never saw that before. Until I looked at that passage, I'd never saw before that what he's doing, he's carrying on. This thing has to, if you will, it, there's a carrier. There's a COVID-20. There's a carrier. Somebody's righteous and God looks down and sees that and that gets passed on to the next generation. The next generation carries it. That's the way it's supposed to be. Look at Ezekiel a minute. Ezekiel. Uh, when you read this, you're going to go, oh, because you, you know this, okay? Ezekiel, I've got to find the book first. And let's just see, let's look at ver or chapter 14. Ezekiel 14. And look at verse uh, 14. <clears throat> 14, 14. 
Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, in what? In the land, in Jerusalem. They should deliver but their own souls by their what? Look at verse 20. <clears throat> Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, swear by himself, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their what? Now, I'm not sure that I understand the whole context there. I mean, I, I believe what it says, and I understand what God's saying, that the Israel's gotten so bad that if those three men were living in the land right now, all they could do is save themselves. They couldn't save the nation. They couldn't save their own children. Yet this man is a preacher of righteousness. He's a preacher of holiness and sanctification. Now, let's regress just a pinch, but not much. Let's take Noah back and let's put him somewhere in the land and let's put him there with his sons while they're out cutting down the lumber, while they're out shaving it and making it. And everybody's running around saying, what's that old man doing? And he picks a passage and he starts preaching on righteousness and holiness. And if your life doesn't change, if you don't get right with God, if you don't do what you're going to do, you're going to drown in this flood and be gone forever. Oh, man, that old man, he must be drinking that stuff he's growing. You see, as it was in the days of Noah and as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days to come in the Son of Man. Now, buddy... You're supposed to be building a house in heaven. You're supposed to be sending a material ahead of yourself. And you start talking about heaven in this world, and they laugh, and they think you're crazy, and what are you on? You smoking pot or something? What's wrong with you? We're there. We're there. We're in that day where we should be showing the world what a righteous person is and how a righteous person lives and what God says about righteousness and holiness and sanctification Instead of we're running from everything that happens. I'm not Mr. Brave. Don't think I'm Mr. Brave. Don't think I sit at home waiting for the next edict to see if I can't bust it. I don't like them. And I realize that slowly but surely, they're closing in on us. And pretty soon they're going to have us right where they want us. But we can't stop being righteous people. We can't stop. We've got to live that life. Why? It's an inheritance that's been passed down to us. It's a heritage that I hope and pray I pass to my, my daughters and my sons and that I, they pass it on to my grandchildren. And if we get that far, if we don't, well, we won't have to worry about it, will we? Right. Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Think of that that little statement, that phrase, think a preacher of righteousness in B.C., whatever it was. And that thing's been going on and on. And he's on a, listen, I think that's pretty good. He's on a three-person list. And both times he's mentioned first. And he's mentioned with this, if he were here. Noah couldn't save the world the first time, Brother Dan, because they wouldn't listen to him. And God said, and if Noah was here today, he couldn't save this land anyways. He could only save himself, which means to tell me that in that day, there was a chance for those people. Listen, there was a chance for those people, but in this day, there is no chance. You're sitting here this morning and Sometimes, you know, you say to yourself, where's everybody at? It's the day we live in. It's taken toll of us one by one by one. And it breaks my heart. Sometimes I sit around and say, Lord, what did I do wrong? I know I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I understand that, Lord. But what is wrong with these people? Can't they see what's happening? Here's what everybody keeps telling me. Well, when this is over, and, I'm, and listen, please, I wish it would get over tomorrow. But I just got enough sense in my head to see that the Lord's doing something. Do you know what the last word, listen, do you know what the last word is in the New Testament? Uh, I'm sorry, the Old Testament? 
You know what the last word is? It's a five-letter word. Curse. And you know what precedes that? The Lord says, and I will send a curse. Maybe we're there. Why I say that? Because in that same chapter, Malachi 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 6, I believe it is, he talks about Moses and he talks about Elijah. He's going to send those two and he says, and I'll send a curse. We're getting ready for the tribulation period when those two men are going to show back up and be the witnesses, get their heads cut off, be a tribulation rapture for the tribulation saints, all that thing. We'll be gone before then, long time before then. And I believe the Lord's setting it up. I hope it gets over. I do. I pray for it. I pray for it to get over. I'm like a couple of preacher friends we were talking the other day. I mean, we don't see any revival written at the end of this book, but I'd take one if the Lord wants to give us one. If the Lord wants to say, I'm going to send a revival up, I'll take it. I'm not going to say, oh, no, you can't do that. I, I've read the end of this book. I don't see nothing there. I've always thought it's interesting. You know, the Lord wrote a book, told us what he's going to do, but he can still do whatever he wants to do. Mm-hmm. Do you something think about that? Why? Well, didn't he repent that he had put man on the earth? Didn't he repent that he had let him go? Maybe the Lord said, well, I'm going to repent. I was, didn't he repent that he was going to destroy Nineveh? Come on, did he or not? Yeah. Well, then maybe you'll do it again. And let, I want to be there. When it hits, I want to be there. I hope you do. The Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7 tells us that also something else that Noah did was that he moved with fear. Now, there's a lot of ways to explain it, and I don't know all the things to explain it, but let me just tell you something right now. When it says he moved with fear, moved is a word that describes motion, right? If you move a bottle from this point to this point, motion was in action. If you take like I'm doing, walking across the podium here, if you're doing that, that's, a, that's an action. You're moving. You're moving, all right? So when it said he moved with fear, here's what I'm thinking. God says, uh, Moses, uh, or Noah, he said, what? He said, uh, I'm really sorry. I, I repent that I ever made man on the earth. And he's wicked and ungodly. I'm going to destroy all of them. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to build me an ark. Okay. Now, I'll tell you my time limit with man is 120 years. That's all I'm giving you. <clears throat> Moses went, okay, I had 120 years to build it. <clears throat> oh, by the way, <clears throat> I'll help you with it, but we got to get two of the unclean animals, and then we got to get seven of the clean animals because we have to have sacrifice when this is all over. So not only did we have two of these animals, but of the clean animals, we had seven. <clears throat> <clears throat> and anybody else we can get in there? Okay, so how am, I, how am I supposed to do that? Why don't you try preaching? Oh, to this crowd? Yep. The Lord said, they'll be Baptists after it's all over right now. <laughs> Lord said, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send a rain. <laughs> now listen, some of y'all don't believe some of the stuff in this book, so don't think Noah believed everything he heard. Rain? Yeah, take my word for it, Noah, rain. Rain like nobody's ever seen if they'd ever seen it. And the Bible says this, that he moved with fear and preparing of the ark. Say, what are you saying? I don't know, but let me say it this way. Maybe, maybe Noah did this. Our calculations is, it's going to take us Wow, that long to build that thing. Well, come on, boys, we've got no time for, the Lord might do this early. He might change his mind. We've got to get this done. And maybe if some of the saints of God in this world would move with a little fear about what God says needs to be done, maybe some things would get accomplished. Maybe there's no fear. I'll tell you something. When my dad told me to do something, I moved with fear. And maybe what's wrong with this Christian nation that we live in and all the people that are 
ducking church today or in church, whatever they're doing, maybe if they'd move with fear for the things of God, things would change. I'm not against the revival. I'm not against people getting right with God. I'm not against doing all that. I don't see it necessarily happening in the Bible. That doesn't mean God can't insert whatever he wants, wherever he wants. But he, you know what? Turn to, if you're not in Hebrews, turn to, I got to show you this. Hebrews 11, right where you're at. I'm going to show it to you. You know, sometimes the Lord just gives me something and I, I just I can't help it. He said this. He said, by faith, Noah, being warned of God, things not seen as yet. See that? Move with fear, preparing an ark to the saving of. You know what? I wonder if it was like this. I think the Lord has a timetable. Do you think the Lord has a timetable? I think the Lord has a timetable. I think he operates kind of on a timetable. It's his own time, not my time. And Noah knew that from what best we can understand that he had a length of time that God was going to deal with man and then it was over. And when God looked down there, you know what he saw? He saw a man maybe up at 6 o'clock in the morning having his devotional time. And then, boys, come on, it's time to hit the woods. We've got to get that uh, wood cut down, that gopher wood. And we have gopher wood here in Michigan. Yeah, we do. Uh, kids are always going for it to put the more in the furnace, but... Maybe when they were out there, the Lord looked down there and said, you know what? He's a mover. And maybe Noah knew that he had a certain amount of time to get that prepared before God would act. And if he didn't get it done, it would maybe the loss of his own life. Maybe God was waiting. Maybe God was up in heaven going like, Moses, uh, <laughs> time's a ticking. I don't know. But he moved with fear in the preparing of the ark. Fear is more than reverential trust, which Mr. Schofield will tell you, and I'm not condemning him or his book. That's what he'll say. It's, it's more than that. Listen, it wasn't reverential trust when I feared my dad. And if you think reverential trust was the word that should have been used in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and by the way, I saw a video the other day, and uh, actually... They, if you go down that part of the country, you can see the outlines of buildings that were turned to ash from that overthrow. I thought it was an interesting video. Uh, when, when God says get something done, you know what God wants you to do? He wants you to get it done. And not on his timetable necessarily. The Bible tells us, you don't need to look this up, but Matthew 10, verse 28, the Bible tells us, that we're to fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Maybe here's the problem, Psalm 2. Maybe this is the problem. Psalm 2, and look at verse 11. <clears throat> Serve the Lord with what? Okay, some of you aren't there, I understand that. Fear. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with what? Trembling. Serve the Lord with what? I think there's a problem. I don't, I don't think we really fear God. I think we just say we do. Because if we feared God, I think it would change the way we live and what we do and how we talk. I think it would change our whole life. I don't think we understand fear. How would you like it if the God, Lord come to you tomorrow and said, uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Unless you get this all accomplished by a certain date, man, I'm going to burn this place up. You think that you... You would, have, you would have thought that Lot would have had a little bit more energy to put out of saving his kids, wouldn't you? You think about that a while. You know what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12? You're supposed to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Say, what's that? Work out. Not work for, work out. When you get saved, you work it out. Why? Well, I don't know. Can I tell you this much? The Bible says that God gave man three score and ten. That's 70. I'm 73. I've reached that and passed it. Brother Howard, he's way past it. I don't even know how. I don't, as a matter of fact, the three score for Brother Howard is a dream. He doesn't even remember what it was. But you see what it, here's, here's what I'm saying. My wife and I have talked about this a couple of times. Did we do the right thing? 
You say, why? Because you get one chance at it, and you only got so many years to do it, and when the years are over and the chance is gone, it's done. You just think about this much. What if Noah would have said, well, tell you what, boys, let's take a 60-year vacation, and we will have 60 years to do this. We should be able to get it done by then. You say, I wouldn't be very smart. Maybe you should think about that. Well, I'm 18. I got lots of time. Can I tell you how fast it took me to get from 15 to, to 70 or 18 to 70 or 20 to 70? Like a day. I was a teenager some years ago driving a, a, a metallic green roadrunner. I mean a Mustang. And I did have a roadrunner too. And I didn't have a whole lot of time for God at that time. And I had the Roadrunner, too. And I had the Duster 340. Oh, I've had some hot rods and muscle cars. Those days are over. Now I'm an old man. I'll never get those days back. And if I didn't prepare in time and do what I should have done, it's all gone. And there's no way. Noah couldn't wait 60 years and say, Lord, could you give me another 60? Lord said, nope. That's all you got. Can I, I'll give you this and we'll move on here. Don't turn there, but you might want to make the reference. In Genesis 8.20, the, mark, the ark was on Mount Ararat and all the kind of stuff was happening and he took the cover off of the ark and let the animals go. You know what the first thing he did when he got out there? He said to his wife, he says, we, we need to take a couple weeks vacation. We have really been serving the Lord in that ark and we've been shut up in that thing and for a year and, and we really need some time off. Lord will understand we don't need to go to church. We don't need to do this kind of thing. Some of you are looking at me like, what Bible are you quoting out of? I'm quoting all the one the world uses. I'm quoting all the ones some saints I know are using today. Huh? You know what the first thing he did when he came out of the ark? Genesis 8, 20. You know what the first thing he did? Somebody tell me. He built an ark. Or, I mean, he built an altar. See, the first thing he did when he came out of there, Brother Howard, was he went down on his face and he said, Oh, Lord, we don't deserve the goodness of you, but thank you for taking us through that time. And thank you for saving our life and my kids' lives. And we're taking it all for granted. And now what are they doing? They're punching in on us. And what are, what are people doing? One by one. Now listen, I'm not judging anybody. Just listen to me. One by one, we're going, well, it's not important anyways. We got the internet. And, and, and listen, I'm not against it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying... Until I absolutely have no choice whatsoever, this is the way it's going to be. When it's absolutely impossible, you say, well, the church, the church is you. The building is where you assemble. Paul met along the uh, riverbank with the ladies. And listen. Listen. If you don't have enough intestinal fortitude to get to church now, I know what you're not going to do when the pressure's on. And I'm not lifting you up and putting anybody down. I'm just simply saying, if you don't have the intestinal fortitude to do what God said, move with fear. I don't even like talking about it, Brother Billy. I don't even like talking about it. It, it bothers me. I don't like talking about it. I mean, I... I We've lived in this country by a piece of paper nobody even knows about. It's called the Constitution. And now when we need it, they're going like. Maybe we should have been living by this Constitution all along. <laughs> Hebrews 11, 7. What else did he do? He moved the fear. Secondly, thirdly, he prepared as God. Now listen, he prepared as God instructed him. You know what I think is interesting about that? I, I, I know there was gopher wood, and I know that they no doubt made those round pegs and put the pegs in it. And I know that they used some um, tar, we'd call it, slime, some pitch 
to pitch up the holes so it wouldn't leak. I know they did all of that. But you know what? I, when I read that passage, I don't know what, I don't know what conversation went on. No more than I went on in the 40 days and 40 nights up in the mountain when Moses and the Lord were talking. But I don't read anywhere and I don't get the idea that, that Noah went, uh, Lord, I don't know how much you know about that gopher wood. Uh, Lord, that, that pitch, you know, that, that thing gets to rocking and rolling on them waves that you've been telling me about. That pitch might not be. Lord said, you know what? This is how I want you to build the ark. You know what he said about his tabernacle? You build it after the pattern I gave you on the mount. The Lord gave you a pattern on how to live. You don't need the preacher to tell you. He gave you the pattern. Now, are you going to prepare for life by the instructions that God gives you, or are you going to do it your way? I don't know what the ark would have been like if he would have done it his way. <laughs> I know what some projects look like when I did it my way. <laughs> Amen? And I've seen some lives of people who did it their way, and it just didn't come out. Is there a witness somewhere? I'm just saying, folks, listen, the Lord gave me some stuff on this, and I, I, I haven't got time to get it all out. I'm going to have to skip some of it here. But 1 Peter 3, 20, and I, I referred to this a while ago, but I need this to refer to it again. But 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, and look at verse 20. Oh, that's wrong. Okay. I, I want the, the one where it says, about, where's Noah? Okay. Okay, there we go. I'm sorry. I was looking for something else when I was looking for something. I wasn't looking for something that I was looking for something. You got it. Okay, verse 20. Which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Remember what I said a while ago? I said that it seemed like God was waiting for Noah to do, and do, it, to do what he had to do. Notice what stood there. And the long suffering in the days of Noah. It was like God knew what he wanted to do and he was saying, Noah, I can't, get, I can't do this until you get that ark built. I can't do this until we get those animals in there. I can't do this. And maybe we're a little slow at preparing. Maybe we're a little slow at following the instructions. Maybe we're not doing it the way God says, look, this is what I want to do in your life. But I can't do it until you get that done. I think back when my wife and I were overseas and we were going to go back and work with Far East Broadcasting Company and be on the radio. I, I loved it and I, that was what I was going to do and, and I guess I thought that's what God wanted me to do. I don't know. And so I went to Gail, Dale Golding who was the, the director there and I said, Dale, so my wife and I feel like the Lord will have us come back here and work on radio station. He said, Paul, that would be great. We'd really love that. That'd be great. You do a good job. We love what you do. Your wife works here in the office and everything. We thought, that was our hope. We weren't coming to Lupton. This is a snake pit. And uh, uh, Art Austin. Art Austin is an old man who bothers you. He's an old man who's spiritual. And I think they bother me, old spiritual men. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like they've got a connection that you don't have. Mm -hmm. And he caught me in the hallway one day and he said, Paul, he said, I love you, brother. He said, I pray for you and your wife. And he said, he said, I, I would love it nothing better than you come back here and work at Far East Broadcasting Company. But he said, son, and you know, after the word son, you know what's coming, don't you? Not anything you want to hear. He said, I really think you need to go home and get a couple years of Bible school and then come back. So I ran over to Dale Golding, you know. This is what Art said. He said, well, I, I want you to come back. I think that's a good idea. And two days later, Dale Golden come to me. He said, Paul, come here a minute. He said, you know what? Art's right. And you know what your problem of it is? Your problem is you want to do what you want to do in the time that you want to do it. And the Lord says, no, I don't think so. And he was right. He was 110% right. I didn't need to go back over there and do what I, wanted, what I wanted to do, which I was going to say the Lord wanted me to do. 
You've all got your own idea, but maybe it's not God's idea at all. God's told you what he wants you to do, but it's not God's idea at all. It's your idea. That's what you're telling. It's God's. I think it's what God wants me to do. But maybe it isn't what God wants you to do at all. Maybe it's what you want to do. When I think about this, I think about what Mary told the servants today. He said, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Proverbs 4, and I've got to move on here. I've got one more thing to give you here. And it'll probably take me a couple, three days. Proverbs chapter 4, look at verse 13. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her. Why? She is your what? What is? Instruction. This is your life. This book is your life. You have no life outside of this book. If you have any life, it's your own life. You're doing what you want for your purposes, your way. And when God gave him instruction on how to prepare the ark, it wasn't Noah's way. It was God's way. This is the way it needs to be done. Yes, sir. And God gives us instruction here how to build our life so it'll be worth something, so we'll help save the lives of others. That's what Noah was doing. He was building that ark so all the animals wouldn't die. And all the people that got in the ark, which you know happened to be eight, just his family. But listen, if I can get to heaven with just my family, hallelujah. And I'm not being partial to my family. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you can get to heaven with your family, amen. That ought to be your goal. And then verse 6, if you will, please, back here in Hebrews. Noah, the preacher of righteousness. Verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must first believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Say, how did he act? Well, you know what it says, verse 7, by faith what? Noah, by faith. How much of our life should be operated by faith? No. Now, stop thinking about this a minute. We have faith promise comments everywhere. Everybody thinks faith promise has to do with giving your money. Well, that's a good start. But shouldn't be faith something that you practice all of your life, every day of your life? It hasn't all to do with money. Maybe it's to do with where you live. Maybe it's to do with who you associate with. Maybe it has to do with a lot of things. But without faith, you can't please God. You know what I think? I think when the Lord looked down there and he says, I've got to find me a man that would live by faith. Well, there's one doing it right now. Noah. And he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? He was doing what God said he had to do. Now, the days of Noah didn't start when he got to working on the ark. It had already started. Chapter 10 in, in uh, Hebrews, look at verse 38. We'll close out here. Now, the just shall live by faith. Now, watch. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Didn't say he was lost. Didn't say he was going to hell. It just said God would lose his pleasure in that man who would draw back what he knows is the right thing to do. Are you listening to me? Well, that man who draws back from that life of faith and won't do what God wants him to do, the Lord has no pleasure in that man. He didn't say he was going to kill him. He didn't say he was mad at him. He didn't say he was going to send him to hell. He just said he had no pleasure in him. Now about you, but I want to please God, and I know sometimes my life doesn't always please him. I know that. And I remind him once, well, Lord, you know it. And he goes, yeah, I don't have to say it. I already know. <laughs> Amen? But it ought to be your goal to please the Lord. Noah found grace. In the eyes of the Lord. 
if he were looking down today, which he probably is, and if he were looking at this church, which he probably is, what would he be looking for? Would he try to find somebody that's willing to fill the gap, somebody that's willing to do exactly what he wants them to do? Would he find that? You're the only one that can answer that. I can't answer it. For you, I can't. Father, Father,